It's been an interesting uh, few days, almost weeks in our country. So many things have happened, and that's always the case. But I'm thinking right now of the death of the evangelist Billy Graham. Uh, how many in the congregation have heard him uh, preach? Let's say, were you there at one of his rallies or something? Yeah, I see a lot of hands. What a remarkable man. And what was remarkable about it to me was the tremendous tribute given to him by so many in our country. One of four regular citizens who has been honored to have his or her body placed in the rotunda. I know that Rosa Parks was another, and I don't know who the others were, don't remember. But the funeral service, just incredible. And what struck me is that you have all of these important people gathered for the funeral, heads of state, leaders, etc. And the family got up and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ and told everyone there that I want you to know that God loves you and he loves you so much that he sent his son to come into this world and to give his life for you and to die for you on the cross that you could be a child of God, saved, redeemed. God loves you. That simple message, he proclaimed it all over the world. And according to the scriptures which we have before us this morning, at least especially in the book of Corinthians, uh, we have people sitting in the pews of those churches in that day in Corinth and in the vicinity who thought that this is rather foolish, this gospel. And it really does seem foolish at first glance because I think most of us understand and know, don't we, that in order to please God, we've got to live a good life. And in order to be a child of God, we've got to be faithful to all of his word and I'm not sure we need all of this other help, et cetera, et cetera. Let's take a look at the scriptures today briefly. With this theme in the background, fools for Christ, or uh, to, to be a clown for Christ. I know that our brother, uh, Mr. Knox over here, is a clown for Christ. What do you call them, Christian clowns ministry? And uh, some others in the congregation as well, I'm sure. I asked brother this morning, well, tell me, what does it mean to be a clown? And he said, well, you remember how if you see a clown, they've always got a flower up here. And one of the first things they do is tell you to smell their flower, you know. And when you do, they spray you in the face and everybody laughs. But when you're a Christian clown, you have the flower. And when somebody comes up to smell it, you push your button, but nothing happens. And you can't understand why it isn't squirting the person in the face. And everybody, of course, knows what's supposed to happen, but it doesn't. So then you, as the Christian clown, you smell it yourself and you get sprayed in the face. And so being a clown for Christ is a way to lift other people up and to make them understand and experience, even in a small way, what it means to be loved and cared for. I guess you could say that the greatest clown for Christ was Christ himself. The Old Testament lesson for today is just, it's one that we all know. It's, it's the one that presents to us the story of how God gave his commandments to his people. And I guess one could say that God gave the commandments to his people so that they would not be foolish in this world so that they would not be clowns, so that they would be people who know what it is to live the godly life. Did you notice that the first verse of the Old Testament lesson today is a verse of great gospel? It's from Exodus, and the Lord introduces the commandments which he is going to give to his people to keep them from being foolish in this world with these words, I am the Lord your God who has brought you out of slavery into a land of freedom. It's a verse of gospel which God gives to, 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 to preface the law which he is about to give. We call the Ten Commandments the law. 
And according to our old catechetical instruction, we remember that the law tells us what we are to do and what we are not to do. That's the law. And so God gives us the commandments. And we think of the law sometimes as something that is negative, something that is killing. And indeed, it does kill. Because we know that if anyone breaks one of the commandments, we face death from God's almighty justice. The sin, the, the soul that sins shall die, the scripture says. So we understand then that the God who gives us this law is the God who has loved us eternally. It's like seeing the, the law through the lenses of the gospel. And so when we approach the Ten Commandments, we do so, understanding that these are words that come to us from our loving God who does not want us to be a fool in this world. Because, as you know, and as I know, probably better than you, <laughs> my father used to say, I'm the worst sinner in this room because I'm older than everybody else. Well, at least I'm not older than Pastor Ludwig, so that gives me some hope. <laughs> but nonetheless... This law comes to us and convicts us. Oh, I wish I could keep the law. Oh, I, I know. I do keep some of it. I haven't murdered anybody. This morning on the Lutheran Hour, Dr. Dale Meyer was preaching. By the way, the Lutheran Hour comes on at 7.30 sharp on FM 102.5 and AM 540. It's kind of a convenient time if you're on your way to church. But it's a wonderful program of proclamation of God's Word. Both Pastor Meyer and um, the other fellow, I can't remember his name right now, I know him well, just escapes me. They're very good preachers. But Pastor Meyer was talking about the commandments this morning. And he said, you know, some of us, we, we take pride in the fact that we don't break at least some of the commandments. For instance, we don't murder. And then Jesus comes along, Pastor Meyer reminded us, in the Sermon on the Mount, which is recorded in Matthew, and he begins to explain to everyone just exactly what the law means. And he says, Jesus does, to the people, you've heard in the past, it's been said by God, you shall not murder. And if you murder, you're going to be in real trouble with God. Well, and some of you, Jesus is inferring, think, well, I've escaped that commandment because I haven't committed a murder. And then Jesus says this, I'll tell you what, if you say in your heart that your brother's a fool, if you call him a raka, which is a fool, you have the same punishment coming down upon you as the murderer. And then the Lord Jesus goes on and talks about the sin of adultery. Well, I haven't committed adultery, so, well, what are you going to do? Say, good, I escaped that commandment. And then the Lord Jesus says, let me tell you, in your heart, if you have had lust for a woman or a man, you have committed adultery. And the point is simply this, that we cannot escape the judgment of God in the commandments. And while God gives us the commandments so that we would be wise in this world, Yet we act like fools. So I guess one could say that Christ has come into this world to turn us into his wise people so that we don't clown around with our spiritual lives anymore. You know, there are so many people in this world today who look at the commandments and just put them aside. Uh, what do we call them? The ten suggestions or comments from another age, they have nothing to do with me. That's more or less the prevailing way of thinking about things in this world these days. If you read secular journeys, journals which talk about America, uh, our, our society, and, and the directions we're going, you're appalled at what's happened in our country over the past 50, 75 years as gradually people are being pulled away from the word of God to do their own thing. They don't want to be foolish anymore. They want to be wise in the world. They want to enjoy life as they have come to understand it. They've taken the 10 suggestions and commandments and put them to the side and have said, I don't need these for my life. I've risen above it. 
how many people in this world, Pastor Green has recently reminded us, call themselves nuns, N-O-N-E-S, which means that they have no religious affiliation, none. It's such a problem in our world. And God comes to us today with his word, and he says, look, be wise. Listen to what I have to say for you. The commandments that I give you are not for me. They're for you, so that you would live as wise people in this sinful and deceitful world. You know, St. Paul, he, we've talked about him in Bible class, and we're going to continue that today. Uh, he was converted, as we say, as he was on his way to Damascus to, to capture Christians, these people that he considered to be fools, and he was going to throw them into prison. And so on his way to Damascus, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks to Paul from the skies. He says, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? And he's stricken to the ground and he says, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you have been persecuting. And so the Lord Jesus Christ takes this man who feels that he is one of the wisest in the world. And indeed, Paul was an educated, brilliant man. After all, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, that ancient teacher who was revered throughout the ancient world as being one of the greatest. He was a wise man, this Paul, who became brilliant because the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to his heart and told Paul, Paul, I am your Savior. I am your Lord. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Before the foundations of this world were ever in place, I knew your name. I called you by name, and I keep you in my heart. And Paul became wise unto salvation. And as you know, then, he spread the word throughout the ancient countries, and, and the gospel prevailed, and people came to know and to love Christ through that wonderful message. And one of the groups that came to know and love Christ was in the city of Corinth. The second lesson for today is St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthian Christians. And it, it's really interesting, folks, when you read 1 Corinthians and you understand how Paul starts that. He says, to the saints in Corinth. What is a saint? A saint is a holy person. A person who is pure in the sight of God. You saints in Corinth, I bring you greetings in the name of the risen Christ. And then Paul goes after these people who consider them some of the wisest in the world. And the first chapters of the book of Corinthians, Paul speaks to us and to them about what is true wisdom. And he reminds us that our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who came into this world to turn it all upside down and to proclaim the wisdom of humanity, that which does not need God as the greatest folly and foolishness in the universe. And our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who gave the gospel, which Paul speaks about so beautifully, the gospel which we need to hear again and again, how it is that Christ died for us on the cross. And that was Billy Graham's message too. He died for you and for me on the cross to take your sin from you, to cleanse you, to free you from the curse of the law, and to make you into one of his redeemed children whom he will never leave, never desert. He will love you forever. That's the folly of the gospel. The gospel proclaimed in all of its foolishness on Golgotha. When the almighty Son of God becomes the greatest sinner in the universe, the scripture says he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. And so our Lord Jesus Christ takes the burden, which is so beautifully portrayed by Isaiah. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows upon him, rested the chastisement of our sin. That's what our Lord Jesus Christ did for you and me on Calvary, and that makes no sense to the average Joe. 
because the average Joe, which includes you and me so often, sees no need for that kind of repentance. After all, aren't we such good people? The Word of God for today convicts us. The commandments convict us, every one of them. When you look deep, deep into your heart, you find that, oh, Lord God, I can't do what you've asked me to do. But when you look deep into your heart, you also then hear the voice of our Lord Jesus Christ, who comes to you and me today through word and sacrament, and he says, I know, and that's why I've come to do it for you. And so Jesus takes our sin upon himself and deals with it so that, as Billy Graham says, in the cross, God forgave all of our sins and gives us the gift of everlasting life. God loves us, every single one of us, into eternity. Our Lord Jesus Christ didn't mess around with sin. He hated it. This episode, which is recorded for us in the gospel today about Jesus going into the temple, how extraordinary that is. And when you read the context of this, you understand that Jesus has just come from Cana of Galilee, where he and his disciples had invited, had been invited to attend a wedding. That's a wonderful, wonderful story of gentleness and kindness, and concern for people in their more or less little problems. And Jesus goes in there and creates huge amounts of wine. I think it's Dr. Paul Meyer, some of you know him, who spoke about this once, and he said he calculated, based on the information that you can glean from those days, that there probably were about 40, 50 people at this wedding, and yet Jesus made gallons and gallons of wine. They had so much wine left over, they had to store it. That's the kindness and care of Jesus now who walks into the temple and is infuriated when he sees people tamper with God's holy things and turn them into a circus. And he takes cords and he makes whips And he beats them out of there. He overturns the tables. And the world is aghast at this one who thinks he has such authority. And you know, underneath this story, underneath the facts, you have the real fact that Jesus comes into this world to take his cord of whips and to drive evil out of our lives. And again, he's done that for you and for me when he is bound by cords and taken to the cross where he dies so that you and I can become fools for Christ and tell the world about the goodness and the beauty of the God who has loved us forever in his son Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen.